Back in 2009, 2009, I went to bed one night and couldn't fall asleep. At the time, I was a single mother of a two-year-old toddler running my own business, and looking back at it now, didn't realize then, but was highly stressed out, had major hormone dysfunction happening, and of course, hadn't been having quality sleep since my daughter had been born. That night in 2009, it felt as though a light switch had been turned on, and no matter what I did, I couldn't turn it off. I would lie awake typically until 3 or 4 a.m., finally start falling asleep, and a few hours later have to get up with my toddler. This went on for several months and eventually sent me into a 10-year dependency to a prescription medication called Ambien. It also sent me into an obsession with sleep, which is still very present today. I was able to come off of them, but I can't say that I have nailed down how to have a consistent good night sleep, and of course, this is worrisome. Now, if you have ever experienced any form of insomnia, whether it was one night or several years of poor sleep, you know that it's one of the worst things to endure. You feel like you are literally losing your mind. Sleep and the lack thereof is one of the most common complaints that I hear from women in peri and post menopause. Hence why I had to, to get today's guest on the show. I heard Dr. Parsley on another podcast recently and was fascinated not only by his story, but his insights into hormones, peptides, and of course, sleep. All of the things that we are so passionate about on this podcast and in our clinic. Dr. Kirk is a certified hyperbaric medicine, anti-aging medicine, hormone replacement therapy, and is currently pursuing national certification in psychedelic medicine therapies. He dedicates a significant portion of his time to advising nonprofit organizations that support the SEAL community and providing healthcare guidance and treatment to veterans. Operating his practice and supplement business from Austin, Texas, Kirk is an avid outdoorsman and fitness enthusiast. When he's not working or working out, he can use, you can usually find him in nature and continuously enhancing his medical skills. You can find him at docparsley.com. So welcome to the show, Dr. Parsley. So happy to have you here. Thank you. That's a great introduction. We should, yes. should probably stop it from there. We can only go down that one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Call it a day. That's a wrap. That's it. Yeah, that's all you guys get. <laughs> well, I wasn't, I was like, do I tell my story or not? Like, and I was like, you know what? That was like one of the worst experiences of my life. And I just yeah. thought, you know what? I, if anybody, most of us have experienced at least a night, if not several right. of bad sleep. And it really is one of the worst feelings in the world. And right as you are going to tell us it's sleep is like the most important thing for your health. So right. it's, it, we can't talk about it enough, basically. Uh, now you've got this crazy wild history. <laughs> like you could actually do a movie about your life. I think I just, I thought of that this morning. I was like, this guy could just, he could have a movie done about his life. It's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it'd be a boring movie for me. I'd have no interest in watching it. <laughs> I'd watch it. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll, I'll talk to some people I know. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll, make, we'll make a movie for Karen. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you joined the Navy SEALs at 17. How, can I ask how old you are now? I'm 50, about to be 54 in a month. 53, yeah. 54. Okay. Yeah. You're about 53, yeah. 54. Okay. So yeah. you, in, when you were 17, you joined the Navy SEALs. Why did you? Well, I joined the that? Navy at 17. Okay. Yeah. Join the Navy. Okay. Yeah. Tell us the story. Um, so uh, as we were talking about earlier, um, I, I grew up in rural Texas, uh, kind of two different regions of Texas, um, kind of on either side of Houston. Uh, first eight years of my childhood was like on kind of on the ship channel. So like Beaumont, Texas and Kima Island and things like that. And then I moved out to an area that was rural at the time called Katy, Texas, which is now kind of part of Houston, which was on the other side of Houston when I grew up. Um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I came from a very, uh, initially very poor and then kind of lower middle class. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of dysfunction in there and, uh, and I, I really, like, I, I really wasn't a good student. Um, I, I think largely because of that, but, um, who knows? I mean, I, you know, I, 
they were they weren't diagnosing kids with ADD back then. I just wanted those kids that needed to be physical and needed to do stuff. So started getting really started getting bad grades really early in life. And uh you know the the going theory on that was just because I was dumb. And so I was just like, all right, well I'm dumb, so I'm not gonna do good in school. So I might as well just focus my efforts on things that I'm good at, which was like physical things. So I was I was a good athlete and uh, I did a lot of different sports and you know, I, uh, you know, the old saying, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. And so the, like, I just, I did all the tough stuff. And then a documentary came out and, uh, in 1987 that, uh, followed, um, the beginning of seal training, uh, a section of seal training called hell week. And it was the toughest oh, is the toughest training in the world. They kept saying the toughest training. And, and I was like, well, I'm tough. So I'm going to go do the toughest training in the world. So that's why I joined. I didn't even know what a SEAL was. I didn't know what SEALs did. Uh, I didn't know they were going to pay me to be in the military. Um, I, and you know, my mom was kind of not very present. And so I, I needed her to go sign for me to join. And she said, okay. And she did it. She didn't know what a SEAL was and she didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and so, you know, I went, I went through SEAL training. Um, and then towards and the end of SEAL training, they, uh, hell week was actually for me, the easiest oh. part of hell week, um, because you can't fail hell week. You can only quit. And, okay. um, the vast quit. majority of people who make, who don't make it through seal training quit. Uh, but quite a few people do fail. And, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very, well, I'm not, I wouldn't say very, but I'm, I'm a large guy. So I, I went, I started seal training at about 230 pounds. Most guys were starting seal training at about 160 pounds. And so there's a lot of running and running was very hard for me. And there's a timed run every week. And if you fail the timed run, you fail buds and you, and you're out. And so, uh, I passed every run by seconds and, uh, it was really hard for me to do, uh, and like the really enduring, the enduring things, um, primarily running but there were some other things and so hell week you just had to keep going and i was like well that's easy like i, I just gotta keep going like not quit like that's easy so there's no problem i i didn't find that that difficult um and at you know after wednesday you're like hallucinating and you're kind of running around <laughs> drunk anyway and so you don't really know what's going on anymore <laughs> so it's like <laughs> you're not even really suffering because you're not really there you're just kind of like you're i mean you're literally a zombie um and so uh, I made it through SEAL training. At the end of SEAL training, they take you around to the different SEAL teams, and then they say, you know, fill out your dream sheet of like what what team you want to go to. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't even know what SEAL does, so I don't, I don't care what team I go to. So I just selected all the all the teams on the West Coast because I was already on the West Coast. I didn't want to move, so I'm like, all right, I'll just stay here. Uh, and so I stayed on the West Coast, and then that's when I found out what a SEAL was and went to the SEAL teams and actually did seal things like buds they don't really teach you much about being a seal and buds it's you know there there's some stuff in there you know like teach you how to dive and a little bit about shooting and stuff but it, kind of a kindergarten level compared to mm -hmm. a seal um and uh yeah you did you know did my time at the seal teams and then um you know decided i did three deployments and it was uh it was peacetime I mean, we had the Gulf War in there, but that lasted like a couple of weeks, I think. And there was like three bullet shot or something. So that was kind of a no big thing. And and we just kind of traveled and did the same trips over and over again. And I was like, eh, I've done this. I'm going to go do something else. And um, fortunately, like when I was in the Navy, um, you yeah, know, there was, there was quite a bit of academic stuff in that. And I did really well um, in that. In fact, I, I think I was either the top student or the second to second top student to every every kind of academic portion I did in the Navy. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I could go to college and do something healthish. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking like athletic trainer or something, maybe a physical therapist was kind of like the stretch goal. Uh, but, you know, being a high school dropout, um, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I didn't cover that. I, I dropped, I didn't, I went to high school for four years, but I was a sophomore by credits. Yeah, I just become a sophomore by credits by the end of that. So, um, so I, I got a, you know, I got a GED, so I didn't have a diploma. And so I had to start at junior college and I, and I did that. And I, because I thought maybe I'd go to physical therapy school, you have to have 2000 hours of volunteer uh, time to even apply. So I started volunteering at San Diego sports medicine center. 
And uh, they, within a week, I think, hired me to work there. And then I worked as a PT assistant or PT aid and then PT assistant later. And then decided it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, and because of my time in the SEAL teams, um, most of the doctors there, the new, like the new doc, the younger doctors of, of the organization were only, you know, a couple of years older than me. So we were, I kind of became friends with a lot of those guys and they said, you should go to medical school. And I was like, you know, you, you should slow down and be realistic. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I just I got my GED. High school, like, actually. You know, let's, <laughs> let's keep things realistic. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, they, they convinced me I should try and I, and I did well enough to get into medical schools. And when I went to apply to medical schools, I found out that the military had their own medical school. I didn't know that, but I was already married. I already had a kid. I had another kid on the way. And so the prospect of getting paid to go to medical school and supporting my family, as opposed to you know, the yeah. usual route. And I said, well, I guess I'll do that. And uh, I'm like, uh, much like school, I'm not a very good rule follower. I'm not designed for that. And the SEAL teams, that doesn't matter because they kind of look for individual guys, you know, that'll work as, work as a team, but like independent free thinking people is or, or largely who the SEALs are. Right. And I didn't know how I'd fit into Navy medicine. And I didn't, didn't, turns out I didn't fit in all that well. I got in a lot of trouble, uh, but I went back to the SEAL teams as their doctor um, and that's where I learned about sleep. Um, you know, I went there as really, really well versed. Obviously, the whole time I was in in undergrad, I worked, which was six years because I went to had to go to junior college for a couple of years first. Um, and th that whole time, I worked at a sports medicine facility, and I I knew a ton of sports medicine. And then my uh, my um, first year of residency and my um, my and my all my medical school electives was all really geared towards orthopedics and sports medicine. So I went to the SEAL teams thinking that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. And um they already had that handled. You know, they we we built a big sports medicine facility and we had ortho coming through and we had sports medicine doctors and we had chiropractors and we had acupuncture and we had PTs and we had athletic trainers and strength and conditioning coaches and all the stuff that you'd want we had. Um so then I was the dumbest guy around again. <laughs> uh, and when you're the dumbest guy in a government organization, when you're the dumbest guy, they make you the the leader, right? So they said, well, you're going to supervise everybody. And I said, okay. So um, I kind of had this nondescript job at that point at the SEAL teams as their doctor. Um, and SEALs are a very untrusting group, um, you know, for kind of obvious reasons, what, you know, what they go through and what their job is. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of really only trust the community. And um, the worst thing you can do to a SEAL is put them on the bench, like take them out of his job for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so they usually just lie to their doctors when they have to go do their routine physical. They're just like, everything's great. I got no problems whatsoever because mm -hmm. they don't want to be disqualified from their job. Um, but fortunately, because I was, I'd been a SEAL and I'd been a SEAL recently enough to where there are still a lot of guys, a lot of guys on the West Coast that I had been a SEAL with, that I'd gone through SEAL training with or employed with. And, uh, and I had a good enough reputation, obviously they trusted me and they would come to my office and tell me this, this litany of problems that they had, um, which I had no idea whatsoever what to do. I was like, don't, I don't, I literally don't have a single clue because <laughs> I went to Western medical school and I knew how to recognize and treat diseases and they didn't have any diseases. Right. They right. just weren't performing as well as they would like. Uh, yeah. and I couldn't have even summed it up that way. It was just like, there's all these symptoms and I don't know, like they all seem unassociated. So, you know, they come and they say, my motivation is terrible. And, they, and you have to put this on a scale, right? They're still, they're still seals. So, you know, their expectations are super high, yeah. but you know, they come and say, my motivation is terrible. Uh, my cognition sucks. I can't think straight. I can't concentrate. I can't pay attention during meetings. Um, I'm emotionally uh, all over the place. I get really angry. I get really sad. I snap at my children. I snap at my wife. Um, I don't feel like getting out of bed and doing what I need to do in the morning, but I, you know, of course they do their seals. Um, you know, my sex drives down, my sexual performance might be down. I'm in a, I I'm in constant pain. I kind of feel achy and sore and I just kind of feel the, what they call brain fog now, but they weren't calling it that mm -hmm. then just like this overall sense of low cognition um and they're getting fatter and they're uh getting weaker despite working with the nutritionist and working with the strength and conditioning coach mm -hmm. and doing everything they should be 
And again, I had no idea. I was just like, and I, had I, you had any of those symptoms when you were a Navy SEAL? No, because, but I, I didn't have... I didn't have the career that these guys had, right? right? So this was 2009. And so they had been in like real hard everyday, you know, combat right. for eight years at that point. Yeah. And, you know, we were Hollywood SEALs in my day. Like, you know, we kind of had like, yeah, let's go skydive and scuba dive and like <laughs> go do some mountaineering and go some hikes and do some rock. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it was kind of like a life of hobbies and ours was pretty easy, like, you know, relative in to comparison, what they yeah. I mean, it, right. It, tough stuff, but it's not the same kind. Um, and so I thought originally, well, I'd heard of things like combat fatigue and shell shock from previous wars. So well, maybe it's that, maybe it, maybe that's similar. And when you look up the symptoms, it's similar. Um, unfortunately, nobody figured out what those were either. Uh, no. And so I just said, well, it's, a, it's some kind of syndrome. I called it the sales, the steel syndrome. And uh, about, I'm, I mean, I'm ashamed to say how many people had to come in my office and talk to me first uh, before I kind of caught on that all of them were using Ambien. And mm -hmm. the command was just handing out Ambien as this completely benign, uh, almost supplement you could take. I was right? going to say like just, a supplement, like everybody yeah, on Ambien. Get, like they give them just a bottle of it and say, hey, you know, anytime you need to sleep, just pop one of these. Because the job is really chaotic sleep because you travel a lot. Mm -hmm. But then also you might wake up and get a mission tasking and say, hey, we're going to go do this thing 36 hours from now. So you're, you're not going to sleep for this 36 hours because you have to go plan it. And then you're going to go do this mission and then you got to come back and take care of all of your gear and debrief and all that stuff. So you're going to be up for four or five days, you know, um, and it might be, hey, the only sleep you can get is in the next 12 hours. So if you want to to sleep now get some sleep and then we're gonna we're gonna start working on this and then of course changing time zones flying all over the world so they just handed this out thinking it was completely benign and that's what i was taught in medical school um you know benzodiazepines right. things like um and or things like uh the val things like and valiums the, and yeah, xanax yeah, yeah. valium yeah. and xanax and yeah. uh those we didn't know things. that the information we do today about those things. Right. Um, yeah. Well, so those drugs were called, those drugs were really bad. We knew they were giving those mm -hmm. for sleep, um, but those killed people and people get addicted to them. And then Ambien came out as this new class of drug, which has some very similar uh, biochemistry to it, mm -hmm. but it's not addicting, they say. And so it's perfect and you can just take it, no problem. And when, when the pharmaceutical industry does research on a drug, um, they own the research. And then when they apply for their drug approval, they give the FDA what they want to give them and they don't give them what they don't want to give them. Mm. And when they go, but however, when they get sued, when they go to court and they do discovery, then they have to release all of their data. And so that had happened uh, around the same year that I was running into this problem. And so I just said, well, you know, what does Ambien do? Maybe that, and you know, I didn't learn, I didn't have a single class on sleep in medical school. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything on, I didn't know anything more about sleep than my patients did. Um, Were you seeing so, similarities between their lab work as well? Like, yes, they're on Ambien, but was there things that you were well, consistently seeing across the board? Yeah. So because I didn't know what to do, I just tested everything that I knew how to interpret. Um, <laughs> that's literally what I did. That that was the first, that was the first problem. Uh, yeah. Big Navy medicine didn't like that because I was running $2,500 lab sets on, you know, three or 400 guys. Um, and, you know, they had really low anabolic markers. So things like their testosterone, uh, precursors to testosterone, things like Anderson and all, that would all be low DHT, the more anabolic form of testosterone, that would be low. Uh, estrogen would be high. Um, mm -hmm. Insulin like growth factor would be low. So sort of everything, and, and even like their insulin sensitivity would be low. So lean, muscular guys, they have abs. They're in, you know, 28, 32 years old. They look like they're in great shape, but they have the insulin sensitivity of a pre-diabetic. Wow. Um, and everything catabolic would be really high, right? So. Right. All, all markers for catecholamine cortisol. were high. Mm -hmm. Their cortisol was super high. Their uh, HSCRP were high. The homocysteine was really high. And like I said, I didn't have a clue. I I really didn't. And so uh, the first thing I thought was, well, maybe Ambien's causing some of these problems. Mm -hmm. 
and I started learning a little bit about Ambien, realized I didn't know nearly enough about what happens when you sleep to know how Ambien could be affecting your sleep. Um, like I said, I, I knew nothing about sleep. And so the, the, the benefit that I did have was that I was, I was a doctor for kind of a celebrity organization by that time. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, they'd already been super, super successful in war. They'd killed bin Laden, all that stuff. And so I could call anybody that I read, if I read their book or saw their Ted talk or saw them lecture or whatever, heard them on a podcast, I could call them and say, Hey, I'm the doctor for the West coast seal teams. I was wondering, could I come train with you? Could I consult with you? Could I ask you a bunch of questions and do you teach me, help me learn about this? And and every single person I called uh, was uh, overly helpful. I, I never had any problems with that. So I got to learn a lot really quickly. And once I learned what was going on during sleep, and then now that all of Ambien, the data about Ambien was out, and I could see how the Z drugs were affecting sleep, and I understood what was going on during sleep, I said, well, this could actually explain every single symptom these guys had. Really? I didn't think it would, I, mm -hmm, but it, it mm -hmm. was... It was rational. There was there's good reason to believe that anything they were complaining about was being affected by their sleep. Um, and yeah, the seals were telling me that yeah they were going home um, at the end of their stressful day, and they were having a few drinks, whatever, a few beers, a few cocktails, a few glasses of wine, whatever, and taking Ambien. And if you know the seal community. If one's good, two's great, three's fantastic, right? So they're taking two or three times the recommended dosage of this and using alcohol. Um, and then they would wake up at about 3.30 or 4 in the morning and couldn't go back to sleep. And they their solution was, well, I'll get up, I'll go to work, I'll get in a really hard workout, I'll work all day, I won't take any naps, I won't take any breaks, and when I come home tonight, I'll be super tired and I'll be able to sleep. And I would say, you know, how long have you been trying that? And like, three years. So I'm like, keep going. Like today's yeah, the day. Right. Uh, and so, um, so anyway, I, I, I literally got laughed out of the room when I tried to tell the leadership that I thought that the performance problem guys were having was associated with their sleep and that the sleep was affecting their hormones. Now the the leadership knew that the seals hormones were bad. I wasn't, I wasn't the first one to, discover that i was the first one to document it and do any research on it but they knew that already and their their assumption was well that's guys who took steroids early in their life and and now they now their hormones are messed up because they took steroids when they were younger and i knew that wasn't the case because i knew i i, I knew several guys really well that were my clients guys that i'd known since i was 18 years old or maybe 17 years old and I knew these, I knew these guys well, and they would have told me, they, they would have had no problem telling me that they had taken steroids at some point in their life and they hadn't. Um, and so I knew that wasn't the case. Um, so anyway, I, I had this idea that taking Ambien could be affecting a lot of these problems. It could be causing a lot of these problems. And so I couldn't just take away their Ambien. So I, I went on very generic things like, you know, PubMed and Cochrane database and just what supplements actually help with sleep and why. And so I, I knew enough about sleep physiology at that point to have some idea why something should or shouldn't work and kind of what was snake oil. And so I went through the database and I said, okay, well, this is proven to help and that's proven to help and that's proven to help. And, and here's why, and it makes sense that that's why. And so I, I came up with a concoction of seven different supplements. Um, and the seals were great patients. They were super motivated. They they would journal. They would keep really good records. They would come in and talk to me, give me feedback, and we figured out kind of how much to take of all of these ingredients and kind of made it what the, what they called was a cocktail, like a cocktail of supplement, and and, and they called it you know the the doc sleep cocktail, and that's what I initially named it when I made it a product, which was a terrible yeah. marketing, thing. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, and so we, they bought all the, so then I just started giving people a handout and then I started educating them on sleep hygiene. And then once we started getting results and we got amazing results, I mean, people's testosterone would triple, quadruple, their free testosterone would triple, quadruple, their IGF-1 would go up, their HSCRP would go down to unmeasurable, their insulin sensitivity would improve. Like all of the stuff that I was seeing 
bad. They it all improved. That wasn't a hundred percent solution for a hundred percent of the guys, mm -hmm, but I would mm -hmm. say on average it was an eighty percent solution for eighty percent of the guys. Uh, and this was kind figured, of tapering back on the Ambien w with these. Yeah. In so place what I did is I they were off I, them. I had them. Uh, I had a compounding pharmacy at that time when compounding, it was a lot easier to use compounding pharmacies. Um, and unfortunately the Navy wasn't behind any of this. So the SEALs were buying all these supplements on their own and they were, and uh, anything that we used, they, it was coming out of their pocket. Um, but I was having their Ambien uh, made into a serum so that they could do droppers and go from right. 10 is a, a milligram per drop. And they could go from 10 to nine to eight to one, like, Yes, and so they just stepped down over ten weeks um, to get off of the Ambien because you know you have to get um, you have to increase the receptor density, right? You start losing receptor density GABA for GABA receptors because of the Ambien. Um, right. And so I got them once I got them off of that, and you know, taking the supplement instead, we had amazing results. And then I got some buy-in from the leadership. Um, then they allowed me to weigh in on their training schedule, uh, go out to their training sites and give them advice on, you know, blacking these things out and making this, you know, this side of the, um, whatever the building you know, where the compartments where they're sleeping, like making these super cold and completely dark and putting red lights in there instead of white lights in case you guys needed to get up and do things. Um, and you know, over, over the course of 10 years made a really big difference. Um, yeah. but, you know, initially, uh, I mean, I had within the first year of kind of figuring this out, getting guys to work, I had 45 year old uh, SEALs who were, you know, they're in high leadership positions now. Um, so they weren't necessarily out in combat, but they, you know, they had had their fair share of combat. So they had all that damage. Um, and, uh, you know, they were getting personal records and lifting and running and like whatever the kind of their preferred sports were at, at 45 years old. Uh, and not not a PR for their 40s, but a PR for their lives. Um, and so we knew we we're on to something. Uh, the, the component that I didn't figure out until maybe uh, the last year to 18 months I was there was how prevalent the traumatic brain injuries were. Mm -hmm. And has Just, very. But I do have questions about Ambien first before we get to go down that road. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not. I wasn't even going to cover it. I just, I was just going to say that. Oh no, uh, I want to go there. I want to go there. TBI has yeah. very similar effects to your hormones. When you look at the hormone profile of somebody with uh, multiple TBIs or a recent fairly severe TBI you'll see the same hormonal shifts uh, that I was seeing from, from oh. the uh, lack of sleep, Ambient. the chaotic right. sleep. It's, um, it's, and yeah, so Ambien has, has some of its own unique problems. Um, like, do you think it was the Ambien that was actually driving a lot of the hormonal dysfunction or was it simply that Ambien doesn't get you into deep sleep? And so they weren't having quality sleep. Right. That was causing um, it. So if, if you look or at, the drug if you itself. look at, yeah, if you look at the data on, so first of all, <laughs> Ambien, the Ambien was a farce to begin with. Um, on, on average, it made you fall asleep 13 minutes faster. Uh, on average, you slept an extra 37 minutes. However, it decreased REM sleep by 80% and de decreased deep sleep by 20%. So it was a net loss. You, you were better off not using drugs and feeling like insomniac, uh, but psychologically people needed to feel like they were getting sleep. And so there was some psychological benefit to it, but mm -hmm. you know, what, what we've found in, you know, the world, the world, world health organization, not, not the most credible source uh, currently, I know because of COVID stuff, but mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they classified, uh, they classified uh, shift work Um which is kind of similar to what SEALs do because they have these chaotic sleep cycles. Um, shift work is a type 2A carcinogen, uh, meaning the wow. sa same as cigarette smoking. So wh what that means is that we're really, we're almost certain that it causes cancer, but it would be immoral and unethical to test for that because we'd be causing cancer but to by doing the test. Right. So you can't test it. So that's what the type 2A means. Uh, which is the same same classification for cigarette smoking. And then, you know, further research has shown that people who are chronic insomniacs or people who take sleep drugs chronically, 
have a life expectancy of 12 to 14 years less than the average person who doesn't have those issues. And I don't think the sleep drugs have anything to do with it. Um, I think that what's happening is people who take sleep drugs chronically are people who are chronic insomniacs. And I think it's the chronic insomnia that causes the health problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, and once you, once you know enough about sleep, it's completely obvious that there's nothing worse for your health than poor sleep. I mean, it's, uh, it makes absolute sense that it would shorten your life because that's when you're recovering and repairing. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we do everything at nighttime is when we're sleeping. And, and do you, do you know if it permanently, is there any permanent damage from using the, the drugs for uh, long periods of time? Well, I, again, I'm not sure that the drugs have any more damage than just chronic insomnia. Okay. Um, and you know, the, I, I always, I always tell people it's just think of it like an injury, right? So there, there's this truth you're born into one, you're going to die. <laughs> Nobody's ever gotten out of this alive. Uh, yep. two, it, it takes eight hours to recover from being awake for 16 hours. It's just the way it is. There's nothing you mm -hmm. can do about that. You can choose not to abide by that and you can choose to ignore it just like you can choose to ignore your death. But it's still going to come. Right. So, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, industrialization, rural electrification, those types of things turns time into money. And so the more people could work, the more money they could have, the better life they could have. And once we had factories that worked, went 24 hours a day, people wanted to get into that. And once we had uh, enough equipment and lights and stuff to for people to work in mass at night, we started doing that. Um, and, and there was no way around that. Um, but it, you know, being uh, being misal misaligned from your circadian rhythm, so sleeping outside of your circadian rhythm, and we can go into detail on that if you want. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, with shift workers, that resulted in the same enhanced uh, or you know shortened mortality. life, mm -hmm. uh, the the same you know mortality increase, uh, you know your life expectancy of decreasing equally. Because I think it's all the same thing, right? So when I, the only reason for me to sleep tonight, and believe me, I was one of those people in college and medical school that if you would have given me a magic wand, I would have said, I don't need to sleep anymore, right? Yeah, <laughs> because right. there wasn't enough time in the day. I, I mean, all you did was sleep and study. And when you were not sleeping or studying, you're worried about not studying or when you're sleeping, you're usually having nightmares about not studying. And so I was like, I would love to not need sleep. Um, but the whole reason that I, that I'm going to go to sleep tonight is because right now I'm right now I'm catabolic. Being awake is essentially catabolic. I'm using my, I'm using all my stored resources to do what I'm doing right now. Just talking and thinking and all that. That's, mm -hmm. that's re that's requiring fuel sources. Right. Mm -hmm. And the longer I go through my day, right? Every cell, every, all 30 trillion cells of me, it's, it, you know, all of life is fractal, right? So I, the Bohr model of atoms looks a lot like a solar system, right? Like everything is fractal. And every one of our cells are just a miniature version of us. So every, every cell in your body takes in oxygen and it takes in nutrients and it does work and then it produces waste products. And it has a cycle where it's supposed to be asleep to us, that means laying down in bed to our liver cells. That's not what it means, right? To our liver cells, it means, well, now's that phase where we repair and restore and rebalance everything. And we flush out waste products and we like restock the shelves with the nutrients and so forth that we need for tomorrow when we're not in this phase anymore. And so the whole reason I'm going to go to sleep tonight is because I have to repair any damage I do. Like if I work out, if, if most people probably know if I lift weights, I don't get stronger when I lift weights. If I go to the gym, if I do anything worth doing when I leave the gym, I'm weaker than when I started, right? I go into the gym <laughs> to overexert myself in hopes that when I recover, I'll re my body will repair me in a way to where I can do more work or at least maintain my ability to do the same work I'm doing. And so when I, if, if I lift more weight, that's than my muscles can lift today. Um, and I damage them. If I work out really hard, I actually rupture muscle cells. Um, and then when I sleep tonight, my body repairs them. 
and it repairs them with the knowledge of what I did today. Like what kind of stress did I put on it? Did I run a hundred miles? Did I try to lift 600 pounds, whatever it was, what was it that damaged my muscles? And then my brain and my body are going to use today as a template to figure out what I need to be better at tomorrow. And so when I go into deep sleep, most people have heard of the glymphatic system where you start flushing all the waste products out of your brain. You're flushing waste products out all through your lymphatic systems of your body. You're cleaning all the waste products of those cells because now it's the sleep cycle for those cells, just like it's the sleep cycle for the overall big version Amen. of you. Yeah. And then after it does all of the repair and repair is simply done by the immune system, right? That's the immune, the immune system is the repair system. It's all the same chemokines and cytokines and all the same cells are doing their their work to repair whatever damage did. So if I sprained my ankle or if I got a viral infection or if uh, my gut's inflamed from something that I ate or, or, you know, I'm fixing the muscles that I overtrained, whatever, my body's going to repair me during deep sleep and it's going to flush out waste products and start repair processes. And then it's going to start restocking all of my energy sources, right? Um, and Is that a different phase of sleep? Well, no, it, it's just as you progress so at the very beginning we have to we have to clear all the junk out of the right uh, imagine a construction crew going now like okay we're gonna clear all the debris and now we're gonna go in and start rebuilding things um and then uh so that's that's deep sleep primarily now, REM sleep is when most of that's really done in the brain so um the nutri the waste products and the nutrients again primarily deep sleep but the work of the brain so everything you hear today, you're going to rehearse when you sleep tonight, whether you have any memory of it or not, whether you actually have a dream about it, you're going to think about everything that you've experienced today. And you're going to try to figure out, is it useful or not? And if it's not useful, you'll do what's called pruning. So the, the neuron will actually get a little bud, like, like a, like a plant or a tree would have during the spring. There's a little bud that are, are we going to grow this or not? And you go, no, I don't need it. And you shave it off or we do need it. And then we, form a connection from that new piece of information we connect it to something else the more things we can connect it to the more we actually know that information right so mm -hmm. i learn a new fact and if i can connect 15 other things i know to that fact well now i actually know that fact and when i wake Mystic. up in the morning i can do work with that and i can think about it from different directions and then yeah. anything that proves to be hey that's reinforcing something that i already knew was important and now it's even more important now i'm, I'm forming what's called durable pathways um, yeah. allowing me access to information. I'm also recategorized well, as I'm rehearsing everything, I'm categorizing things to see, uh, like the emotionality of it. Was that, you know, was the emotion that I experienced during that? Is that appropriate? Is that something that I want to continue? Where should I file that on like on one to 10? So if you have a fight with your spouse about dirty dishes in the sink, well, that should probably be done like as soon as <laughs> like as soon as the argument's over, that should probably be out of your brain. Like maybe two minutes of like, what a jerk or whatever, but it should be gone. Um, what we find is that when people have poor sleep, they emotionally categorize poorly. And we think one this is one of the things that oh. happens with PTSD. Um, so if you don't emotionally categorize things well, well, then the next time you see a dirty dish in the sink, that could be a six. That could be a trigger of like a six or a seven that's going to lead to maybe we should get divorced or right? you know something right right exactly over this little this little infraction and we think that happens with PTSD when people experience trauma they tend to not sleep very well uh, after the trauma because of rehearsing and reliving things when you're asleep mm -hmm. um so to answer your question if i don't get enough sleep if i if i stay up for 24 hours or 36 hours i've gone longer than I should have. And I have a bunch of waste products that I, wa that I wasn't able to flush when I should have. And my brain, that that ends up being uh, a, the protein you've probably heard of, the beta amyloid proteins. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and that's, pathog that's pathogenic or pathologic, which, whichever category you want to put it in. So that, that's a sort of a marker for damage in my brain. The longer I'm awake, the more of that I have. The sooner I go to sleep, the more of that I can get rid of. So I can't reverse it a hundred percent. So I always tell people it's sort of like an injury. If I, if I break my leg and I immediately go to a doctor and I have it set and I you know, get, it gets it x-rayed and they put the bone stimulator on it and I have a cast and all that. And I, and that a year later, 
I probably won't notice that at all, right? If you did mm -hmm. an x-ray of my leg, you would still be able to tell that I broke my leg. There'd be some scar tissue there. And that's kind of what happens in our brain when we do something like shift work or we have chronic insomnia. It's like, well, we're building up some beta amyloid plaques, possibly some more things, possibly some tau proteins. Um, but we're, we're, we're sort of damaging our brain. And and when mm -hmm. we're damaging our brain, when we have un when we have waste products that we aren't getting rid of, that causes inflammation. And you know, that's really what inflammation, that's what atherosclerosis is, is really inflammation. So when your body gets kind of tired of fighting something off, uh, fighting off chronic inflammation, and the brain, it puts protein around it, puts like a protein wall around it. And our blood vessels, it puts calcium around it. Most of your body puts calcium around it. It's like, we don't want to deal with this anymore. We're going to build this brick wall. It's like a calcium wall. We're not going to deal with it anymore. Um, so chronic inflammation leads to calcification everywhere. And when it's in your blood vessels, it causes problems. But this these protein right. plaques in our brain, that's, again, it's from chronic inflammation. So and that th there leads is to some the damaging aspect of plaque, that. Right. Basically, like, and this is probably why it came out. This is when my doctor took me off of Ambien because she was like, there's a new study that shows that it's going to increase your risk of Alzheimer's. Right. And really, it's the lack of sleep. And right. Going into and it's the lack sleep. of sleep. And then the other thing is, we didn't go to it in depth. But when I'm when I'm in deep sleep, not only is my body repairing everything, well, that's when all of my hormones are being balanced, right? Mm -hmm. That's when 98, 99, a hundred percent of of my hormones are being secreted during deep sleep, and that's the slow wave sleep, the theta and delta sleep. So I go to sleep in stage one. That's when uh, really just. Being asleep really just means that you aren't, your brain isn't paying attention to your environment. It still has the capability. It's just choosing not to, right? Um, so that's the state that you've put yourself in. So when you go to stage one, that's kind of when you can still hear and sense things, but it it's not the same. Like we know it's not the same. It's like, yeah, it's a little weird. Like I'm hearing somebody talk in the other room and it's kind of, I'm kind of drifting in and out of a dream and making sense of that. And so that's stage one. Stage two is proper sleep where you lose awareness, like you're no longer paying attention to your environment. Um, and then that's what we call transition sleep. There, There's some things going in there, but it's not really one of the considered to be one of the primarily beneficial roles of sleep. And then you go on to stages three and four, deep sleep or slow wave sleep. They keep recategorizing things, but that's when brain waves are going really slowly. That doesn't mean your brain's going slowly, but the overall pattern of brain waves is, is slow and low. And that's, that's the most anabolic time in your life. That's when your stress hormones are the lowest they will ever be in any 24 hour period is when you're in deep sleep. You think of fight or flight is that's maximum stress hormones, right? So when right. you get in a car wreck or whatever, fist fight or like some <laughs> really dangerous uh, situation, um, that's fight or flight. That's maximum stress hormones. It's also maximally catabolic. Like you are using your body as a, everything in your body is willing to go, to be lost, to get away from this threat, right? So you, you will use every resource you have to get away from the tiger or the guy with the gun or the car wreck or whatever. It's like fight or flight, maximum stress, maximum catabolic. Deep sleep is maximum anabolic, minimum stress. So that's when my growth hormone is being secreted. That's when my testosterone is being secreted. That's when my estrogen and testosterone balance is being balanced, you know, being balanced out. The neuroregulation of my appetite, like my leptin sensitivity is being balanced. My ghrelin sensitivity is being balanced. These are affecting my appetite. My insulin sensitivity is being re insulin, rebalanced. Yeah. All of that's happening during this really anabolic time because I need anabolic hormones to do this anabolic stuff. And so that's when the big surge is. And then like, and then you do in one sleep cycle, you'll go through stages. When you hit stage four, you kind of go across the timeline in the bottom for maybe 60 minutes or so. And then you start climbing back out from, you go from stage four to three to two. And then instead of going back into one, you go up into REM, you do a REM cycle. And then when that ends, that whole block, we call that block, uh, that's one sleep cycle. And that's 90 to 120 minutes long. And I told you what happens in REM already. I'm I'm learning essentially. I'm rehearsing everything. I'm categorizing things and I'm making sense of new information. And so they both are very important, right? Mm -hmm. One sort of mm -hmm. restoring my brain, my cognition and all that, and the other and my emotions and all that. And then the other one's primarily fixing everything physical. And, and so, how much deep sleep or ideally should we be getting? Like now we got all these sleep trackers that are telling us 
yeah how many of these stages we're doing i actually got rid of the aura ring because it was stressing me out so bad because it kept telling me that i wasn't going into deep sleep for very long <laughs> right. so i was like i gotta get rid of this <laughs> right um yeah so you know my advice on the wearables uh and I, this is inside i'll answer your question but my advice on mm -hmm. the wearables is like use the wearables if that's if that's something that you like and that's yep. useful to you <laughs> if it's stressful for you don't don't use it uh, i mean the problem is you know it's running an algorithm and so when we do uh that so that thing i just described to you going from stage one down to four cross back three two and back to rem and then back down into stage two like that sleep cycle on a chart that's that's very geometric it's like these rectangular square lines and we go okay uh that's that's good sleep architecture that's good quality sleep and some of that's deep and some of that's ram and we can quantify it on the timeline and when you do like a whole night of that we call that a histogram and that's so that's what the wearables are trying to emulate now when you do a sleep study we're scanning like we're measuring your brain waves right uh and we're measuring your brain waves and we're measuring whether or not your eyes are moving or we're measuring how much your facial muscles are moving and your body muscles, muscle tension in that and your respiratory rate and your blood pressure and your heart rate and your heart rate variability. We're combining all of that into once we've done thousands and thousands of people and we put all that information together, we can say, well, reliably, you're probably in deep sleep here and REM sleep here. Things like Garmin and iWatch, or Apple Watch and mm -hmm. uh, Aura Rings and Whoop Bands and all that, they're running an algorithm that they're getting some of that, a few pieces of that information, uh, the mm -hmm. actigraphy, we call it, like how much you're moving around. They can get they can get your heart rate. They can get some heart rate variability. And then they they just assume that, right. well, okay, that, that matches this uh, sleep study where you would be where that would be in a sleep study but you don't have all the rest of the information and it's running an right. algorithm so it's an approximation and i tell people like i have private clients that i work with and i and i don't care if you want to use it we'll use it if you don't like i have 75 year old you know entrepreneur guys who They've ne they've never they don't have, they don't even have an iPhone they don't even have a smartphone they want nothing to do with any of this technology so like they 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 use a journal and they write down yeah. what time they went to sleep and what time they woke up and how they felt and like how they felt that night like that day before they go to sleep like how did I feel today I feel good I you know did I feel energetic did I work out like maybe just a few things whatever we decide to measure and they keep a journal and that works just as well. Um, what tends to happen with the data is like m the more data, cause you, you know, you have people who they have an aura ring and a Garmin watch to back that up. And then they have their continuous glucose monitor on and they're checking their ketone levels. And, uh, and it's, it, for most people Stress. that's maddening. It's like, you know, when you, when you help someone, you know, when I help someone lose weight, the worst thing I can do for them is increase their stress around food. So yeah. <laughs> Like, like, well, you need to weigh and measure this and you exactly. need to get exactly yeah, this yeah. many macros of this and this. And then I just stress yeah. them the hell out. And like, they're never going to yeah. be able to stick to the diet. And so if it stresses you out, don't do it. Um, mm -hmm. And anyway, so your, your, uh, your question was how much, how much should you get? And it's, it's roughly about a third. So about a third deep sleep, about a third REM sleep, right. and about a third stage two sleep. Mm -hmm. And that ballpark is is kind of usual. We don't know what ideal is. Mm -hmm. We can say young people who are really healthy, and that's how I run my medical consulting, my medical practice, is I, I try to reapproximate youth physiologically the best I can. So I use like the 25-year-old version of a male or female kind of as the ideal. And that's what we try to approximate approximate when we when we do sort of any interventions where we're adjusting physiologic or biologic markers. We kind of shoot right. for that time frame. Um and so if you look at that age group, there are about a third of about a third. Um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's that's post Framingham because sleep science is only about 60 years old. So we were already well into the industrialized age um, by the time we even started testing any of this. So I don't know, maybe it would be, yeah. maybe it would be 40 and 40 and like 20% and stage two. If you looked at hunter gatherers, I don't, I don't know. I've seen yeah. data on hunter gatherers 
with that tigraphy and stuff, but not with like real sleep studies. No. And so we go through two of these blocks in a night. Is that what you said too? And so well, each the, block has yeah, both so there, REM and deep. There's, there's two constituents of each sleep cycle. Oh, so okay. Okay. deep sleep and REM sleep. Yeah. And then that 90 to 120 minute block is one sleep cycle. So you go right. after REM, you go back into another deep. And at the beginning of the night, your sleep is primarily deep. About 80, 90% of that first sleep cycle is deep sleep. That's the anabolic time. That's when I'm getting all my hormones ready to do everything my body needs to do during my sleep. And then progressively throughout the night, I'm doing less and less deep sleep because I've done the repair. Now I'm preparing and a lot of that's cognition. So I'm doing more and more REM sleep. And the last sleep cycle is about 80% REM and only 10 to 20% deep sleep. And so that's how the progression goes throughout the night. And that's why it takes eight hours, right? Because right. you have to have all of that. If yeah. you go to bed really late, you maybe diminish your deep sleep a lot. If you wake up really early, you're probably diminishing your REM sleep a lot mm -hmm. um, because of your circadian rhythms. When you fall asleep, your circadian rhythm's already going. Like the rest of your body's still doing it circadian clock, whether you're asleep or not, it doesn't matter. And so it's going to change kind of what phases you enter sleep in. And if I could go to sleep during that eight hours and I could completely repair 100% of everything that happened to me today, every waste product, anything I damaged, any microbial infection, everything got fixed 100%. And then I restocked everything, cleaned my brain, formed all the memories I wanted to form, pruned everything I didn't. If I could do that 100%, I would wake up exactly the same every day and I would never age. And when you're kids, you can think about, well, kids do better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, much better. They have a, <laughs> a, a, right? Especially you take them in adolescence, their hormones are going crazy. They need like 12 hours of sleep. They aren't getting it because of our school system. That's a whole nother uh, soapbox to climb on there. Um, but they actually wake up taller and stronger and faster and smarter, right? And then somewhere around 25, that kind of plateaus, that stops, and then you you plateau for about 25 to 35 around there. And then after that, you start waking up at like 99.9998% or something. Um, but now if I if I say, okay, it takes eight hours, but I want to get ahead. I'm a go-getter. I'm going to be better than everybody else. So I'm only going to sleep six hours. Right. Well, I've just chosen to get rid of 25% of my preparation for the next day. Wow. I've also chosen to age 25% faster. So there really is something to eight hours. There is. And mm -hmm. it's not exactly eight hours. I use that number. I've had ridiculous Twitter fights that went on for weeks over this. Um, <laughs> but where we get that number from is uh, something called bunker trials, which has been re redone a bunch of times. But the original data came out. William DeMent was one of the researchers. He's the godfather of, of sleep medicine. And basically they took college kids and they put them in these World War II bunkers during the summer. So they didn't have to go to classes. And they put them in these cold, dark rooms. There is obviously way before iPhones or anything like that. So there's no light in these rooms. So they couldn't read. They couldn't do anything except lay in bed. There's a bathroom in there. They could lay in bed to go to the bathroom. And that was it. There wasn't a chair to sit in or anything. So the only place they could sit or lie was the bed. And they put them in there for um, 14 hours a day. And they let them out for 10 hours a day. Only college students would agree to this, obviously. Yeah, no um, <laughs> and they had to pay them. Um, but what happened is the for, at, at the very beginning, almost everybody slept about 12 and a half hours when they first started. And then as you let them adjust over time, they sleep less and less and less until they're all sleeping about eight hours a night. Huh. And then no matter how long you run it from there, they still sleep about eight hours a night, which is crazy, right? But to think that means they sat or laid in a dark room on like laid down on a bed or sat on a bed in a dark, cold room for six hours and didn't fall asleep. <laughs> most people couldn't do that, right? So we're, most of us are sleep deprived to some degree. Yeah. Um, but that's what we call sleep adapted. So when once once we've done that long enough to where you've consistently slept for eight hours a day, that's sleep adapted. And, and that's the number that we've come up with. And what we mean by sleep adapted is like, now that you've consistently slept well, like as, as well as you're able to sleep, 
I can now test you on anything. And that's your baseline. That's your real baseline. Mm -hmm. And I can say, and there's been subsequent studies where I use that information and say, okay, this could be something you are already proficient at. It could be your sport, your skill, your thing that you want to do, or I can teach you something new. doesn't matter. After you've been sleep adapted for say six weeks, eight weeks, I say, come in in the morning and I'm going to test you on this thing. Either something like, again, either something I teach you or something that you already do. And then tomorrow night, I'm only going to let you sleep or tonight. So I, you come in this morning and now t this night, tonight, you only get to sleep six hours instead of eight. And I want you to come in the next morning and test again and you'll do worse. Mm -hmm. And when I ask you, how do you feel? How do you, how do you feel like you did? You'll say, I did worse. I, I was tired. I didn't get enough sleep. And then, and if I repeat that at, Another day, you'll say the same thing. And if I repeat that another day, you might say the same thing. But by the fourth day, 100% of people will say, I've completely adapted to the six hours. And I think I've done as well as I've ever done. And you can hold up the graph and show them, nope, you're still getting worse at the same rate that you've always been getting worse at. And they will argue with the researcher and say, oh, that's not true. And so most people, when I start talking about and, and we haven't gone into hardly any of the stats about the, the detrimental effects of, of poor sleep. <clears throat> One of the things that's commonly conferred, uh, uh, compared to is intoxication. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Which sounds a lot mm -hmm. like what we just talked about, right? Wait, after you have one drink, you're aware, two drinks, you're still pretty aware, three drinks, maybe but by the time you have your fourth drink, you're like, I'm fine. I can drive yeah. home. Like whatever. Right. So yeah. it's the same kind of lack of awareness. You start not understanding yourself. It becomes this new ba baseline to you that you consider to be normal. And that's one of the things that happens in, in society is people mm. deliberately limit themselves to six hours of sleep. And then they say, I feel fine. And convince themselves. That's and fine. that's their new normal. Right. But let me ask you this. You do. I know you know a lot about hormones and stuff. So. If I'm supposed to sleep eight hours, if it takes eight hours to repair and prepare for tomorrow, and I choose to sleep six, tomorrow still comes. I still have to do everything tomorrow that I was going to do with eight hours of sleep. Now I have to do it on six hours of sleep. I don't have the resources. So how do I do it? How do I compensate? What's your guess? You start to pull in from the adrenal hormones, I think. More stress hormones. Yeah. Because yes. <laughs> that's what stress hormones do. Stress hormones keep you alert in proportion to your environment, right? Every, right. They get a right. bad rap. Because they're, they're life bad. or death. You know, like they're yeah. they're great, right? That's what they're wakes great. you up in the morning. If, you, yeah. if you're in this pill, if, if you're in this pill bunker uh, trial, there's nothing to wake you up. There's no sounds. There's no lights. Why are you waking up? Well, you're waking up because your stress hormones, you've recovered enough, right? Deep sleep, I told you. Almost no stress hormones whatsoever, lowest you'll have. As your body repairs and everything gets in order, your stress hormones start creeping back up and they reach a level that's high enough to wake you up. And that's a normal level to wake you up. Now, if I don't get enough sleep, my stress hormones haven't reached that level, a really loud alarm will cause my stress hormones to get up. And then I'll get up and I'll go take, I'll go drink some caffeine, which will stimulate my adrenals and I'll get my, cell, my stress hormones back up higher. And now I'll feel fine or I'll go work out and I'll stimulate myself into it. I'll put some bright lights in my eyes. I'll stimulate my adrenals. Either way, any of those ways I can increase my stress hormones. The problem is stress hormones are catabolic. Stress hormones are what's aging you. And so you're still choosing to age faster because you've, you, you're using these stress hormones to compensate for your unwillingness to sleep for eight hours. And it's, it's simply killing you. And that's why you die 12 to 14 years younger because <laughs> you, you're, you're 25% more catabolic. And, and all, all being older means is that you have fewer resources, right? You lose yeah, muscle, yeah. you lose hormones, you lose yeah. pliability, like your flexibility, you lose strength, you lose you know, immune functions, chemokines, cytokines, like you're, you have right more senescent cells, more zombie cells, so more cells that aren't functioning as well. So you don't have the resources that you had when you were young, which means you're more likely to die from any infection or you're more mm -hmm. likely to get any disease. Or you're more likely to not recover from an injury or whatever, to die from an injury, right? It, you think about, you watch these videos of skateboarders jumping their skateboards off of buildings and falling down flights of stairs and they jump up and run off giggling and limping. But a 75-year-old 
you know, trips over something and falls on the floor, like they they might die, right? <laughs> like so, yeah. it's, it's it's simply a lack of resources. So that's what it means. And so mm. you're you're choosing to diminish your resources early by I'm, choosing I'm, not to sleep. I'm comparing myself to the Navy SEALs now, uh -huh. physically. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, um, just thinking because I was thinking as you're talking, I'm like, yeah, no wonder I had insomnia come on when I was just coming out of that two years of being up all night with my baby, always mm -hmm. on alert, right? Like as a mother, you're like, you know, the smallest little sound your baby makes and you're wide awake instantly, right? Right. right. And that can, I feel like hasn't stopped. Like I, it's like I hardwired myself to be on full alert. And when you were saying like, oh, when you go to bed, you're supposed to shut down and not be aware of your surroundings. And I feel like I still always am. And then I was like, yeah, and Navy SEALs would have had the same issue. They would have had to be on call constantly, right? Like if they were deployed yep. somewhere and they would have to be on guard all the time. And so that is your cortisol and your adrenaline staying elevated and like ready to go at any at a given moment. God forbid the yeah, child it's, wakes it's, up or you got to go to war. It's just, it's I know just I what we really call compare those, but you know, it, like, yeah, it, 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 it is an, insomnia. It, it is an exact comparison. I mean, it is it is exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter what the stressor is. It, what matters is the response to the stressor. And and what you're describing is hypervigilance, which is one of the things we associate with PTSD, right? And and traumatic brain injuries is hypervigilance. People who go to war see the world as a much more threatening place. So they come back home and they're going to whatever, an Applebee's, and they're seeing threats all over the place, whereas the yeah. average person doesn't see that. And so they're hypervigilant. They're running around with excess stress hormones. When you're a mother of a young child, and I can tell you even having been a father of three young children, you're hypervigilant again, right? Because you, like you said, every little noise, well, that could be catastrophic. They're, you're young. I, you know, I had, I had one of those boys that, you know, would have done anything to kill him. It's like he he seemed to be actively trying to kill himself every day. Kind of you know, like he his just dad? wanted to climb on everything and like they all the craziest thing. You're like, why would you even think to do that? And, and so you become hypervigilant. And just like mm -hmm. uh when you don't get enough sleep and you use stress hormones to keep you alert more. Well, stress hormones, like I said, they keep you alert in proportion to your environment. So the higher those are, the more hypervigilance you have. Right. Mm -hmm. So it works out very similar. And that, now the problem is, I told you, deep sleep is the lowest stress hormones you'll have at any 24 hour period of your life. Well, what if you can't get them down that low? You have a really hard time going to sleep. So if you're using stress hormones to compensate for not sleeping enough, now you can't sleep because your stress hormones are too high. Mm -hmm. And now you don't sleep well tonight because your stress hormones were too high when you went to bed. And so now we get worse sleep and now you need more stress hormones tomorrow. It's a self-propagating downward spiral. You just keep getting worse and worse and worse, more and more catabolic. Another interesting aside is that there isn't a single animal on this planet that sleep deprives itself on purpose other than humans. Mm -hmm. The only time other mammals will sleep deprive themselves is if they're starving or if they're being preyed upon. So if they're being stalked, they're only going to sleep as much as they have to because they're going to get killed in their sleep, right? Yeah. Um, or if they're starving, there's a lack of food. So they want to be able to get up earlier and travel farther to look for novel foods. And in both of those situations... And fight or flight, your prefrontal cortex doesn't work, right? If you're in true fight or flight, you couldn't remember your phone number if that was the if that's what was going to save your life, you would die because you wouldn't be you don't have any executive functioning anymore. You're meant to be reactionary, just like when an animal's being stalked. It's meant to be reactionary. You we don't want it. So thinking is too slow. You can't think your way out of a out of a catastrophic situation. You have to react. It has to be reflexes. That's why when you're in fight or flight. Your reflexes are faster, right? Your pain threshold is higher. You're superhuman. You can see more. You can take in more oxygen. And so it's very reasonable to suspect that because we only started doing this to ourselves 100, 120 years ago, our brains are probably wired to think the same thing. So when we don't sleep enough, our brains go, oh, we must be in danger. Mm -hmm. And so we release more stress hormones. Maybe we're starving. Well, I told you my appetite regulation happens with my hormonal measurements when I'm in deep sleep. 
So I wake up in the morning. Well, if my body and my brain believe that I'm in, I'm in famine, and that's why I've woken up. That's why I'm not sleeping because I need food. Well, my brain can only use glucose. So I need some glucose. What's the best glucose source we have? Sugar. So I'm, I want some sugar. My brain wants sugar. And because I might be in famine, we better try to store some fat. Mm -hmm. So all I'm going to crave is sugar and fat. You have evolved to eat enough to keep you alive. Willpower will not stop that. At some point, you would eat your neighbor to stay away, alive. Like That's mm -hmm. just the way the world works. You mm -hmm. are going to try to keep yourself alive. So you can't willpower your way out of this. This is a hormone. You are broken metabolically. And to think that you're going to now go eat salads and you know have a whatever have a have a perfect yeah, macro balanced diet and work out and all this other stuff it's not going to happen when you're metabolically broken like that your your brain and body are going to be craving fat and sugar and so the american diet post industrialization what we fry some sugar so make some bread put a lot of sugar in it fry that thing in some fat now we call that a donut and because I didn't get enough sleep, I still have a bunch of adenosine in my brain and I'm going to use some caffeine to block that and to stimulate my adrenals to push me a little higher. And now I'm going to have coffee and donuts for breakfast, which of course is metabolically disruptive. Um, and something I didn't talk about, uh, although sort of alluded to, if I don't get enough deep sleep, when I wake up the next day, my insulin sensitivity is decreased substantially yep. my testosterone is decreased substantially yeah. my growth hormone is decreased substantially my inflammation is higher and another thing which your audience may or may not know is that um you know testosterone is thought of as the is the primary um sexual Male hormone, for hormone men. but it, but it's for women too yeah Right. Yeah. And so it, yeah, it's just the primary sexual hormone. hormone for women yeah. too and it's the first thing that women lose mm -hmm. um you know because when you're young, your primary source of, of testosterone is actually from your ovaries because mm -hmm. your ovaries are actually producing testosterone that's being converted into estrogen by aromatase. And if your ovaries can produce more than the aromatase enzymes can change over, can then you get your basal testosterone from that. And that starts slipping away on women at about 35 years old, 35, 30, yeah. 35 years old. That's where cellulite comes from, actually, is the lack of testosterone because testosterone sets muscle tension and it sets the muscle tension that's holding your skin to your fascia. And when that relaxes, it causes the little dimples Ooh, and waves and stuff. So, so um, you know, messing with sleep is the worst thing you can do yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's like it's, I'm trying to make this case that there's nothing there's there's literally nothing you can think of that's affecting your performance, that's affecting your ability to move towards any future you want. There's nothing you can do that's going to enhance your ability to do that more than sleep. And there's nothing mm -hmm. you can do that's going to de defeat your attempts to do that faster than mm -hmm. not sleeping well. And there's mm -hmm. no competition in it. When um, we're lacking sleep, are we, are we inducing over time brain inflammation from lack of sleep? Yeah. That, so that's what that because you aren't repairing, right? Those, those mm -hmm. beta amyloids that you're laying down, that's brain inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, and so the seals obviously have it a lot worse because they have all these blast injuries that are causing actual TBIs on top of that. So they have more and more brain inflammation. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what, what you were causing, seeing, right? Yeah. And that's what was causing a lot of their hormonal dysregulation. So that's why uh, even though sleep was improving it, it wasn't a hundred percent solution. Once I started working with the brain inflammation, well, then that 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 was a total game changer right there. Do and you I see can that have, in non Navy SEAL people too. Oh yeah, like that. Oh okay. yeah, yeah. Brain, okay. So Let's brain, talk about that. Uh, brain injury is very actually very easy to induce in today's society. Um, so uh, the the sport that has the most brain inflammation is actually soccer. What from from heading the ball. That impact is Not such so cool. a severe impact. Okay. Uh, they have, they, because they do that so frequently um, right. and they do it for such a long period of time. Whereas like you think of a boxer, well, they're only getting hit in the head really when they're sparring and they usually have sparring gear on when they're getting hit in the head. And, and like, so the only time they're really getting hit in the head is like when they have their fights, which maybe they have 40 or 50 fights their whole life, right? Well, soccer, like every day for how many years are you doing that, right? So uh, soccer has a huge impact. Obviously, football has a huge impact. 
um, any kind of, you know, pugilist fighting sports are going to have that impact. Uh, but, but what's been really underappreciated for a long time is blast. Um, so in 2009, what kind of turned me on to this, was, there was a JAMA article in 2009 talking about brain injuries. And they looked at uh, something called DTI, which is this imaging that's so accurate, they can see a single neuronal track break. Um, and that wouldn't be noticeable. There's no way you could perceive that in yourself, uh, that, right. that you broke a single neuronal track. But that was the minimum to hit a brain injury, essentially, which was 1.09 Gs. And they got that from the acceleration changes on a roller coaster. Um, oh. So like all these kids you know, that do these crazy bicycle things, mountain bikes and ramps and skateboards and like all those types of things, parachuting, like a hard parachute opening could be two to three G's. Uh, like there's all sorts of things. Um, you know, you, you can, you can have hard enough falls during skiing and have hard enough falls water I skiing. Have. You can like, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of things you can do. And those are minimal, but what we've figured out in the seals, um, they made a, they made a, a skull that was completely transparent out of a, out of a, some sort of polymer or plastic that, um, that mimicked the density of the skull. And then they built a brain inside of it with all the layers of different densities. So they used different materials of different densities to simulate sort of the dura layer and then the fluid the, and the vasculature, and then the gray matter and the white matter and then the vesicles and the fluid and the vesicles and all that. And then they set off blast next to it and then they watched it with uh high speed photography where they could slow it down and watch the blast wave go through the brain and what happens is every everything that's a di is a different density moves at a different rate and so it caused a shearing effect so it sheared the dura off of the blood vessels and blood vessels off of the brain and the gray matters off of the white matter and the white matter off of the vesicles and um, wow. and then we had huge, uh, beta amyloid and tau proteins all around the brain where all the shearing was happening. And so in the seals brain, it was everywhere. Um, wow. and what we figured out is that just like when we practice our, what we call CQC close quarter combats where you're, um, or is that was CQB, uh, 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 CQC close quarter combat. Yeah. Um, so you go if you go through like the training houses are usually concrete rooms because you're not shooting through the walls at your, at your friends. Um, so the one, so one bullet out of the rifles we use the M4 has, has an impact of 35 G's and you have four guys in the room shooting multiple times. And you do this thousands and thousands of times for days and days and days and weeks and months. Um, it, you know, you've seen like the big 50 cal machine guns on the back of, of vehicles, like Humvees, yes. whatever it's 65 G's inside of that with wow. every single one, our boats transit at 65 G's, 60, 65 G's, they peak over a hundred G's. And that's actually impact force of just like how fast, because they're going so fast and being the waves. Um, so there's just all like all of this stuff at the civilian sector. I mean, there's plenty of people who shoot who go yep. hunting and shoot, you know, shoot rifles, shoot pistols, shoot pistols inside of concrete rooms, indoor ranges, like all of that type of stuff. We also, of course, found some toxicity from lead and copper and things that, you know, in the combat environment. So there, there was a lot. Which going would on cause brain, brain inflammation as well. Yeah. Lead and yep. stuff. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, wow. And so, so now you have sleep deprivation, chaotic sleep, any type of chronic inflammation happens to your whole body, right? It's not, yeah. your brain yeah. isn't excluded. So if you have chronic yeah. inflammation from anything, you have brain inflammation, alcohol inflames the brain. Um, and so Ambien, I, I think I said, Ambien decreases deep sleep by 80%. And yeah. I'm sorry, REM sleep by 80% and deep sleep by 20%. And alcohol does the opposite. So when I did sleep studies on the SEALs, they had 99.9% .9 stage two sleep. Because they were wiping out, they were using alcohol to take their their sleep drugs, right. and so and it was wiping Ambien. out all their deep sleep and all their REM sleep. Wow. Um, and so I don't even know how they survived. When I, it, it's one of the, there's many phenomena in medicine. Once you learn enough, you go, well, how how are people even living through what they're doing? Um, I know. Yeah. It, you know, the sleep deprivation should have killed them long ago. Uh, if, yeah. If what we know is 
what we think is true is true. So that, you know, there's obviously compensatory mechanisms and a lot of biological. Mm -hmm. that, Can you measure brain inflammation like with something? There are peptides that help a lot. Hyperbarics helps a lot. Um, and actually the psychedelics help a lot. Yeah, let's talk um, about so the psychedelics because that was so, I had never heard that before. And I heard you say that, you know, like a dose of mushrooms, I don't know how much, but of psilocybin can reduce brain inflammation. Yeah, so um, the the research on this is really fascinating. So most most all of the psychedelics are working through a molecule called DMT. You probably hear that, mm -hmm. di dimethyltryptamine. Mm -hmm. um, and that's normally secreted in our brain. Uh, we think this is where the near-death experience comes from, like a, a hyper-secretion of uh, DMT, very similar to what a lot of people experience when they do psychedelic um yeah I've said hero what, what they call heroic doses of psychedelics so psychedelic right. journey so for heroic uh, i would call it for, stupid yeah yeah <laughs> for uh for psilocybin that's somewhere around like five, five grams okay um Oof. and so it's it's this huge dmt rush um, and it causes all of this dissociative behavior and all the, a lot of, most of the time, visual hallucinations, sometimes just emotional thought hallucinations, um, which that, that would be akin to like, uh, waking up with some vague memories of being in a dream that didn't really have any visual component, but you just had some really weird thoughts and emotions that didn't really make sense. And you kind of woke up with that. So that, so that's kind of what it, it can be like a lot of times those visual hallucinations anyway. Um, but so you go all the way, uh, there's, there's a type of DMT, um, that's in plants. There's a type of DMT that's in, um, the resin of this Sedona toad, this frog. It, oh, right. Like you scrape it off of that and then you smoke it like a crystal, like a crap pipe kind of thing. Um, and, uh, that comes on very strong, goes away really quickly. Um, much like foods, like when the nutrients and foods are, are buried in fibers, they, they tend to take longer to absorb and take longer to act and take longer to go away. So when you go into the actual plants themselves, uh, things like psilocybin and ayahuasca and iboga, those, those all are again, working off of DMT. There's other effects. We don't know exactly what exactly anybody who tells yeah. you they, anybody tells you they can tell you exactly what's going on is full of it. Then no, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of neurotransmitters changing. Uh, which isn't just simply for DMT, but DMT is driving a lot of it. Um, okay. But it does uh, it does decrease brain inflammation. It decreases amygdala tone. So when we're talking about fight or flight, that region of our brain that stimulates us into fight or flight, that threat awareness, what you were talking about, being a new mother, being hypervigilant, that's amygdala, right? The the mm -hmm. more what we call amygdala tone, just think of that as like the volume on the stereo. It's like how high is it turned up? The more amygdala tone you have, the more anxiety you have, the more stress you have, the more vigilant you are, the more stress hormones you have. And what we find is with these psychedelics, it's that I I personally think this is probably the primary way these things uh, help so much with PTSD. Because uh, they are the most effective tool we have for PTSD. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, they decrease amygdala tone by up to 90%. Um, and that you probably have not experienced since you were a child, like when the world was really safe. And you, know, you're, right. and you, you had parents and grownups around you taking care of everything. Like you probably haven't experienced a 90% reduction in your amygdala tone in your adult life. And then when you do... Uh, you know, the journey dose of psilocybin that can last for up to three months. Ayahuasca can last for up to six months and Ibogaine can last for up to a year. Uh, now that's obviously diminishing, but, um, but significant reduction of amygdala tone. Now, the other thing that all the psychedelics do is they, en they enhance neuroplasticity because they cause a release of a bunch of growth factors. And because of the huge neurotransmitter shifts, you have regions of your brain that are communicating that haven't communicated probably in your whole life since you were like an embryo. Um, and so you get this, uh, you know, some, some researchers are calling it like this uh, 
trans like this transmitter cleanse because there's so, there's like so many neurotransmitters going at, so and so many places like everything gets saturated and everything gets cleansed out with lymphatics and it and it kind of just resets receptor uh sensitivity is what a lot of people say i don't know about that i don't know how that would happen mm -hmm. but i do know that it causes a lot of growth factors so it causes brain derived neurotropic factor which allows you with this chronically inflamed inflamed brain remember inflammation is a sign of damage so around every little beta amyloid plaque you have there's damaged tissue around that um so this neurotropic these neurotropic growth factors, they help you regrow neurological tissue. So you, you get new, new neurons. Uh, the psychedelics also cause a release of stem cells. Hyperbarics causes a release of stem cells. Hyperbarics causes a release of growth factors. So you get some very similar effects. Another growth factor that it, it enhances something called VEGF, which vascular endothelial growth factor, which causes you to, br to grow new uh, blood vessels in your brain. Your brain, you know, you're not at, not all regions of your brain are well supplied with with uh, blood supply, and the more brain inflammation you have, the more those vessels retract away, and mm -hmm. so you can get more blood flow, which essentially is more nutrients. You can get brain derived neurotropic factor, which is new neurons. You can get glial cell derived neurotropic factor, which is more synapses, more connections of your neurons, and so you get this increase in brain plasticity, which is what little kids have, which you can you can just simply learn better, right? Your brain's communicating better. You can think of things in any any which way. It doesn't it doesn't matter to you. Like I'm not like I'm not grumpy. I'm not a grumpy old man because I'm 54. I'm a grumpy old man because I don't have any neuroplasticity left. Right? And I think there's a certain way to do things, and that's not the right way to do things. And so quit doing it that way. And that makes me grumpy because I'm just like, well, you know, that's not right. Like that's not how you do it. That's not right. That's not the way you things are done. So neuroplasticity allows you to think and grow your brain in a new way. And then the lack of amygdala tone gets rid of the stress and anxiety that's involved with trying to make personal changes. Which, so I think that's how, like, I, my personal opinion is those, like, those, are, that, those two things are why the psychedelics are so impactful. We don't right. have, any, like, we don't have anything. Inflammation. We don't have anything in the pharmaceutical industry that, can go this, they can no. come anywhere near that like not like no. nothing close like like it's orders of magnitude below the efficacy of a single dose of these things and yeah. i've seen some amazing but they have to be high dose you're saying like what about microdosing mushrooms do they see so, similar so the, the my the the benefits of microdosing by definition you shouldn't be able to tell that you took a microdose of psilocybin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it should be below your level of perception but what it does do is it does enhance neurotropic factors, like I was talking about, and it does help reduce amygdala tone. So over time, it's over Slow. time, you're, you know, it's a, a few percent lower mm -hmm. amygdala tone um, and a few percent higher growth factors. And so if you do that consistently uh, and you don't overdo it to where you lose sensitivity to it, um, then, then you get some, you get some good benefits from it. And most of, yeah. Most of the programs that do, uh, I think the best programs out there that do psychedelic uh, retreats, uh, especially for veterans, um, they they front load the experience with a lot of training about what you're going to experience or what's going to go on. And then also with microdosing so that it's not so novel to your brain. Oh. Um, and, then they, and then you go to a physical retreat of a couple of days where they actually give you this higher High dose, dose. With, what we call the dissociative dose, which kind of you know, makes you not aware of your environment, sort of like being asleep where you, everything kind of gets distorted. Um, and because that's where the, that huge pulse of DMT and a lot, huge pulse of those growth factors, um, which leads to just a huge flushing, like I said, and that huge flushing and all those growth factors and growing new blood vessels and all that, that helps you get rid of the brain inflammation. And the actual DMT, does it, is that directly impacting the inflammation and lowering it or is it the on D all of those the DMT mechanisms it's, that it does it the, the, yeah the dmt itself um it's just it's affecting the physiology of all the neurons right so right, right. so yeah. i mean all the neurons are communicating with neuro neurotransmitters and the dmt is acting essentially like a neurotransmitter so it's exciting 
certain regions of your brain to do more of what they ordinarily do. And then it's turning other regions off and it's letting other regions influence each other that usually don't. Um, how that how that ends up right, <laughs> doing yeah, everything that it does is anybody's best guess. We got we've yeah. got a long long time from figuring that yes. out. Yeah. Um, because it only matters what it does to a human brain. That's not something that's going to lend itself to animal studies. No. And really, the only way to know what's going on in the brain is to actually measure what's going on in the brain. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know you're going to have to have holes and catheters and and the like through the skull into the brain to figure out what's going on. And that's not research that's likely to go on with humans. Um, and I don't even think primates would matter because they don't have the same complexity of thought and culture and, you know, all, all of, all of the stuff that interferes with our ability to live our lives the way we want that, you know, no other animal has it. So I, I don't know that that'll ever be solved. Mm -hmm. Unless maybe we get imaging good enough to where we can tell mm -hmm. what sort of molecules are going around people's brains. That's the best. So many best of us don't want to do these. <laughs> I mean, I've had yeah, my fair share. I've done the mushrooms, the acid, the peyote. I haven't done um, ayahuasca. I've done ketamine. But yeah, like these are back in my recreational fun days. So mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, who knows what, what I was getting out of that. But I really don't want to have to take high doses of ayahuasca to sleep, <laughs> to fix my sleep no. problems. So I heard you talk about peptides being a, an alternative solution. Mm -hmm. So do you see yeah. those working as well? Yeah. So um, there, so th there are peptides that help a lot with brain inflammation and there are peptides that help a lot with uh, stimulate neurotropic factors. Um, so there's, there's a peptide called cerebrolysin that's been around for, probably 120 years or so. Uh, it oh. originally came from the brain of pigs. Um, it's now like anything else. It's, pr it's produced enzymatically now. Um, and, it, and it's it, a bioregulator it has... peptide, correct? I'm sorry. It's a bioregulator peptide. Yeah. Yeah. I would classify okay. it as a bio, yeah, as okay. a bioregulator. Okay. Yep. Um, and uh, that actually increases uh, just like psychedelics, just like hyperbarics, it increases neurotropic factors in your brain. It actually puts them in there, but uh, some of the other growth factors in there stimulate growth factors in there. Um, it decreases inflammation. So it has the VEGF, it has the brain-derived neurotropic factor, it has the glial cell-derived neurotropic factor that has a lot of cytokines and chemokines that will reduce inflammation in the brain. Um, dihexa is another form that uh, is a great, anti-inflammatory for the brain you can put that on as a topical cream um, or you can take it as a capsule um, any of any of the anti-inflammatories will help any of any of the immune regulators so like bpc 157 or any of the any of the thymus derived of thymogen tb 500 tb4 like all of those uh, overall help with inflammation and by decreasing inflammation systemically you're decreasing brain inflammation as well mm -hmm. um CMAX is another peptide uh, that has been pro proven to enhance uh, neurotropic factors and neurotropic growth in the brain. Um, Selenc is a balance of those two. Selenc um, is an anxiolytic for mm -hmm. some reason, for reasons I still don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nasal spray, um, but it both decreases brain inflammation and increases neurotropic factors. So and anything that increases neurotropic factors, you can also think is like a nootropic because it, it's helping your brain learn faster, essentially, because it's increasing your ability to form new connections and the health of your brain. Um, let's see, what else? Do you have a favorite that you see being really effective with your Cere guys? Cerebralis Cerebralisin is the most effective one, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. I almost always, if it's possible, I will always recommend doing that with hyperbarics. Um, oh, okay. and cerebralisin is a short dose. It's, um, it's just a lot of fluid. It's, it's 10 mLs a day for 10 consecutive days, but you only have to do that once every year or two. Um, okay. and hyperbarics has a lot of the same effects. So what I usually do is I have, uh, most most people most people's uh, the the prescription for most people's uh, hyperbarics is eight weeks, and so I say do four weeks, 
do your cerebral ice in, in the middle of those four weeks, you know, and then finish, finish out your, your, uh, treatments from there. Um, there, there's, uh, the, the IVs that have, yeah. uh, NM, NMN, NAD and, um, uh, glutathione in them those those seem to be good at decreasing brain inflammation and enhancing sort of neurotropic growth as well i don't i haven't i haven't seen as much research about that just because that's that's kind of a newer idea um interesting enough most most of these peptides are really really old uh mm -hmm. most of these peptides have been around 60 plus years 60 80 100 years uh the russians were really have been really into them for a long time uh, so most of the literature is is Russia and in Eastern mm -hmm. European research, uh, but it's been it's been around a long time and it's being validated. And, and peptides are normally in your body, so everything in there is just like we're choosing to selectively enhance that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, my ideal protocol, uh, I usually only recommend. Um, I use I usually recommend psychedelics for, for people who are like. Uh, that that are essentially suicidal people people that are like right. so like they have so much PTSD and like and you can't even you can't even get rational thoughts in their heads and yet um that that tends to be like a kind of a big momentum breaker you know it breaks the momentum yeah. of, of their depressive ruminative thoughts and it gives you an opportunity to, to do other stuff uh mm -hmm. the other place i've i've found it uh to be super effective is on uh people with long covid uh or oh. people with really bad uh people with really bad reactions to the vaccine which is essentially the same thing as long COVID. Um, so they just have a lot of spike protein in the brain, causing a lot of inflammation in the brain. Right. Uh, so I have found psychedelic to be helpful for that. But yeah. again, in both of those cases, um, I have people do uh, the hyperbarics with the psychedelics and oftentimes they'll do the peptides as well. And then the yeah. other thing is what you already know is that hormones greatly affect your um cognitive functioning and inflammation so the mm -hmm. the best anti-inflammatory in your body is testosterone like that's your that's your natural anti-inflammatory um, yeah and estrogen for the brain i mean it does the, yeah. it works on the and, same and, thing that mushrooms do yes yeah yeah and very good for preserving the brain function and mood and yeah yeah so yeah. and you so you use all of these tools in your own clinic yeah, i i use wow. i use every i use everything that's out there, which is um, I, I'm fortunate in that I have, uh, I like I do annual programs. I do private private clients annual programs, um, and I and I and just I get men? to learn. I get to learn all the new cool stuff. Like anything that's out there, I learn about it. My patients are usually really educated, and they read books and learn about stuff and say, "Hey, what do you think about this?" And I. Uh, you know, my that. patient, my patient load is designed where I can spend two weeks really learning how to learning a lot about something and calling a bunch of experts or go like, I'll, sometimes I go train with an expert if there's something new. Um, yeah. Like a lot of the regenerative stuff, I've been doing a lot of that lately, going to train with regenerative doctors. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in that um, new ways of using stem cells and, um, and exosomes and things like that. I, I'm, I'm, trying to get smarter, smarter on those things. Um, and then the, uh, the other, uh, the other part of my practice is working with the seals. Um, and so it's really all performance based. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. really working with a lot of disease. I'm, I'm right. primarily just working with relatively healthy people that want to perform yeah. better, have goals. They're having a hard time reaching. Yeah. And you, so yeah. you have a sleep product, so let's make sure we talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> So you yeah. created your own sleep formula based on the work that you were doing with the Navy SEALs and just trying to figure out, okay, what's best to help with the causes of insomnia, basically. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the best way I can describe it, uh, there's, there's probably a better way to say it, but I've been saying it this way for years, but, you know, 
we we have so much research now with nutrition and exercise physiology and uh, sleep science and the science of, science around mindfulness and all that. Like we have so much data, uh, even genetics and epigenetics now and gut biome and all, like all these things we can measure now. We could we could come pretty close to saying like, here's the ideal way to live your life. Right? There's this. Like, here's what you should eat. Here's how much you should sleep. Here's how much you should exercise. This is how much mindfulness training you're like, this is, this is the ideal line. And we set up this perfect program. And then there's reality, right? There's over here, like, well, I'm getting there, but there, that's as close as I can come because I have a job and I have kids and I have responsibilities and I travel and whatever. Um, and so we, in between there is where we supplement. Like, that's how I think of supplements. Like, well, lifestyle got you here. In between here, we use supplemental things, and those supplemental yeah. things could be hyperbarics, or those supplemental things could be Hormones. a muse to teach you how to meditate better, or mm -hmm. those supplemental things could be nutritional supplements. So my supplement is really 100% a nutritional supplement, right? So it's um, there, there's no tricks in there, right? Pharmaceutical... Um, yeah, when the sun goes down, of course, you know, melatonin gets secreted. One of the first things, melatonin is like the initiation of thousands of cascades that change in your brain that about three hours later make you really feel sleepy. And one of the most important things is the increase of that neurotransmitter GABA, capital G-A-B-A, gamma immunobutyric acid. And what that is doing is it's slowing down the brain, right? It's affecting our neocortex, how we interact with the world. We've talked about it all the whole podcast that we aren't interacting with the world. We usually, the way we usually do. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what these do. That's what GABA does is it, is it makes you quit moving. It affects your motor cortex and it makes you quit interpreting your senses, your eyes and ears and nose and mouth. Everything still works. You just aren't paying attention to that. And so that comes from sleep hygiene, right? Getting the blue light out of your eyes and settling your brain down. You can overcome the GABA effect, right? Any animal can. Uh, GABA can be flooding your brain and you be in a dangerous situation and you're going to just wake up and go right past it. Or you go to happy hour with your friend when you really feel like going home and going to sleep and you you take a, you know, you, you drink alcohol, which is should be decreasing your energy and neurological functioning and you ramp up so you can overcome GABA. So all this in my supplement, the initiation of GABA, I want I do a super, super small dose because I only want to do the initiation. I don't want to make GABA for your or I'm sorry, take it over. melatonin, melatonin. Uh, I don't want to make melatonin for your for your, I don't I don't want to give you so much melatonin you don't need to make any. Yeah. Um, I want to give you enough to initiate it. And then your brain makes melatonin all night. But from the time the sun goes down until the time you wake up in the morning, your brain only produces about six micrograms of melatonin. So even a one milligram pill would be way too much, right? So I only have right. a couple of micrograms of that, hoping wow. that at least one microgram, like one microgram of that maybe gets to your brain, mm -hmm. two at the best, but probably not. Um, and that's enough to initiate the cascades, right? So you get that. And then we know the the melatonin production pathway starts with, um, you know, the tryptophan coma of Thanksgiving, right? The... Um, the amino acid tryptophan can, becomes 5-hydroxytryptophan. And then with the help of vitamin D3 and magnesium, 5-hydroxytryptophan becomes serotonin. Serotonin becomes melatonin. And so my product has tryptophan, 5-hydroxytryptophan, magnesium, vitamin D3, and then a little bit of melatonin. And then I have GABA in there. GABA doesn't get pressed, didn't get past the blood brain barrier super well. So oh. um, there's an amino acid L-theanine that helps sort of intensify like the effect of GABA. So I put a pretty big dose of GABA in there to try to get some in the brain L-theanine to help that work. And then the one kind of tricky thing I just added a few years ago, um, phosphatidylserine mm -hmm. um, actually lowers cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, I love that would ordinarily be going on, but we're kind of super concentrating it. You could still mm -hmm. get phosphatidylserine from food, but we're kind of super concentrating that. So the mm -hmm. really my intention was, you know, if if you if you live like a hunter gatherer, if you go if you ever go out camping or something like that, and you don't have any electricity. You've experienced this idea that the sun goes down and then you sit around a fire and you chat whatever, and about three hours later you feel super sleepy. 
but nobody spends three hours getting ready for bed. No. So I'm like, all right, well, what, what ordinarily ramps up in your brain? Well, everything I just said, like all of that stuff ordinarily ramps up to get towards the melatonin production pathway and some melatonin gets secreted and GABA. And so I'm just like, well, if you spent three hours getting ready for bed, this is kind of what it would look like. So we put that in there. Um, and then your body uses it and it flushes it all out. And there's nothing in there that lasts more than three hours, four hours. And so you um, and think to the... take it three hours before bed? No, 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 no. You oh, take okay. it. So be because you aren't spending three hours getting ready for bed. Okay. Uh, ideally, maybe an hour before bed, but I, I think the, I think the packaging usually says, I think it is 30 minutes to an hour. Um, you know, so uh, again, we're trying to super concentrate as if you have spent three hours getting ready for bed. Um, and then that cascade has to keep going. Like your brain has to keep doing work. So I, I'm just sort of bringing lumber to the construction site. If the construction crew isn't there, there's nothing that there's nothing in my product that's going to be helpful to you. Uh, so if you have, if you have really bad insomnia that's caused by your anxiety and you're worrying, do you mushrooms. Know, it's going to help a little bit, but it's not going to be magic. It's not going to turn it off, no, right? Right. Um, right. But, but it's it's going to put it, your brain's going to be in the physiologic state to where it can do the right things if you can allow it to do the right things. Okay. Um, but the biggest issue is that stress with sleep. Um, and, you know, despite all the things we've talked about, all the things I do in my practice, the most powerful thing that I do is this four page worksheet. Yes. Which helps you people get, that helps people get audience. the stress out of their sleep. Like that's what, yeah. that's it. Um, yeah. That's, that's 80% of the solution for almost every client I've ever had with, with uh, insomnia. And it, and then like mechanically you can learn it in a day, mm -hmm. but it takes somewhere between two to four weeks before the little, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy click there's like some little switch where you go oh like it hits you one day you'll go oh i get it okay i get it now and then you can and then you can keep going and um anybody who's learned that technique you'll never have insomnia again because that you wow. won't have insomnia from that cause again because right. it because you will you will know how to do it because once you, like you can you can practice the techniques but wait until you understand it when you really understand it and you click you're like Oh, like, of course, I, of course, the only thing I should ever do in my bed is sleep or meditate like that. It doesn't make any sense to do anything else because in the morning when I want to handle all my tasks, like that eight hours, I should have spent only sleeping and meditating or right. reading yeah. or praying or whatever you want to call it. But like, it doesn't make any sense to do anything else because the closest I can get to sleep is meditation or prayer or breath work or, you know, things that are lowering my stress hormones. Like that's the closest I can get. And so yeah. why would I do anything else? But you can't do that if you're thinking, <laughs> if you're worried. No, <laughs> no right? you if, certainly if cannot. If you're worried and you do, if, if you do worry, if you're worried and it takes your cortisol up to seven and you do breath work to bring it back down to five, well, you should have been at three <laughs> with anyway, right? So it's like, so yes. it, you know, it, it's going to help, but you know, um, it, that's the only thing that makes sense. And once, once you realize, once you get rid of that worry, once you go, okay, everything's written down. I understand it all. Like, okay. Uh, and then once you, once you really go, oh, that's such an obvious thing. Why would I ever do anything different? You'll yeah. never struggle with it again. Oh, I can't. And I think my, my team has set you up with that, right? Yep. Like, yeah. Yeah. So you if, that, if you guys go to docfirsty.com forward slash Karen Martell, and I'll put the link in the show notes, it's a free okay. gift, um, the little yep. guide to sleep. So like he said, a little four page little thing that you can practice and then you can get the supplement on top of it to, to also yep. enhance. Cause I, I do think that supplementation can be very helpful as well. I can't go to bed without my little things. <laughs> right. So right. yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to try your supplement. I, you probably can't get it up here in Canada. Hey, cause it's got tryptophan. Yeah. Um, my, my, it. if, if you email my team, mm -hmm. uh, I can't ship it but there are people who can ship it for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, there's third, there's third party shippers that will ship supplements to you. Um, yeah. And I don't know how intense your border is or like what they'll do with it, but like, you know, oh, uh, mo most people do it. Like up, but... I, I have, I have, I, I don't know that I have an influencer in, in, um, in Canada. I, I have one in Australia and one in New Zealand that they just, 
they buy it by the case and then they sell it out of their, oh, their little right. shop, whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's on them. Like they've had, uh, I know at least the Australian guy has had, it, has had it seized once before. Right. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm coming to Austin twice in the next few months for a speaking conference that I'm doing. So I well, will just have to get it shipped to my friend's house then. while I'm down there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how I got trip to found was last time I was in Florida. I got, I ordered it on Amazon and it was there the next day. So I can just do that with yours. Um, well, thank you very much. I mean, I could keep, quit, keep picking your brain for another couple hours, but I know you got to go. So do I. So thank you so much for your time and for everything that you've shared with us. It's, it was fascinating. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I appreciate the opportunity to spew my dogma. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much.